Okay, everybody, here are the slides that I promised you, and so we're going to run through this fairly quickly. Just a reminder, this is from the Nielsen textbook, um, and this is the, the book you had last semester, and we're continuing with Chapter 9. So the first couple of sections are basically reviewing sinusoidal functions. Um, this is what you took the quiz on. So basically, uh, just showing you on this slide uh, how we shift a, sin uh, a sinusoidal wave in time. You'll see the solid blue line here is basic, a basic cosine. It has a period from peak to peak of 2 pi radians or capital T is, is what we call the period. Um, if we shift this sine wave to the left, that's the same as adding an advance of phi radians onto the argument of omega t. So adding phi shifts to the left, and we call that a time advance because the peak of the dotted line hits before the peak of the original one. Similarly, we can have a time lag if we subtract phi from omega t. And again, phi is in radians. And so that would result in the dotted line being slightly to the right of the solid line. So here's some useful things you want to remember. Uh, if these are not easy for you to memorize, uh, you'll want to have them on your equation sheet. Uh, again, radians is kind of the default unit when we deal in, in these functions, but sometimes you might be more comfortable working in degrees. Uh, you can set your calculator into a radians mode, uh, but uh, you need to do with whatever feels comfortable to you. We, we often work in degrees. Uh, this expression shows that the sine lags uh, the cosine by... 90 degrees. So if you went back to the previous plot, the sine would actually start here and it basically lags by 90 degrees. So that's how we get that expression. Uh, this is basically the formula for root mean square. The name comes from square. That's where the square comes from. Uh, the mean, I'm taking the average value over one period. And then I am taking the square root. Root mean square. Again, this is for a periodic signal, so that's really important. Uh, for sinusoids, we have this familiar thing that we've been talking about in our diode circuits. And this uh, expression, this is showing uh, a sinusoid with a phase angle delay. And if I factor out the omega, I can express this as a time delay, where tau is in the same units as time, or seconds. And this is the relationship the results. And Euler's identity, this is a handy formula to, you'll probably have it memorized before the semester is over. Um, you're probably using it in signals and systems. If not yet, you will. Uh, but basically this is an expression how we can express the cosine in terms of complex exponentials. So if we, if we took um, well, I'll get to that later when we use it. Okay, so this next piece is, uh, we're looking at actually an RL circuit, and we're kind of going to uh, give a sense of where we're going with the sinusoidal steady state analysis. Note that VS is, um, it's a sinusoidal voltage source. Uh, when time equals zero, I close the switch. And, uh, and I can write this expression. I'm just using KVL to write um, the expression um, for the sum of the voltage, sum of the voltages across R and L have to equal Vs. 
Now, when we solve this differential equation, we should get an expression for the current as a function of time, and it's made up of two components. I'm calling them ITRFT and ISST. And so I guess in the language of your, your math professors, the ITRT, this would be the transient response or the response due to initial conditions, or maybe the natural response. There are lots of different terminologies. And then the I, steady state, is what we have once the transient has died away. So this would be the forced uh, response that is due to our sinusoidal input. Now, again, if the system is stable, and these are passive elements, R and L, so it will have to be stable, that is going to go to zero as time approaches infinity, and we'll be left with the steady state response. So we're going to be looking at the steady state response, first of all, when V of s is equal to uh, a function of a cosine function. So here's what we're dealing with here. Basically, if we have a linear system, and all of our RLC circuits are indeed linear systems, if we put a sinusoid in, this is a special property of uh, linear systems, we're going to get a sinusoid of the same frequency out. So it's the same omega. What's different is that depending on um, the frequency we put in will have an amplitude that depends on the frequency and a phase angle that depends on uh, the frequency. And the phase angle is with respect to the original, the phase angle of the original um, input. Now, we use a little tool because when we start looking at uh, working with uh, trigonometric functions, um, they get a little bit nasty to work with. And so what we do is we use um, a concept called the phaser. And it's basically using complex numbers to simplify our analysis. And so this expression here is how we write a phaser in terms of a complex exponential. And then we use Euler's formula to write that out in terms of uh, the cosine plus j sine phi. And this is what's called the, um, the rectangular form. And the second one is a shorthand for the first line, where we just take the, the, amp, the uh, magnitude and at the angle of the phase angle. And this is what's called the polar form. And using these makes it very easy to uh, add, subtract, multiply, and divide different cosines, sinusoids. So when we add and subtract using phasers, we would tend to want to use the rectangular form. Because when we add two complex numbers, it's easier to just add the real parts and add the imaginary parts, and then we get a single complex number. For multiplication and division, we use the polar form. And we take now this should have been R2, and this should have been theta2. Sorry about that. But when we multiply, we take R1 times R2 is the new magnitude, and theta1 plus theta2 is the new angle. And when we divide, it's just R1 divided by R2, and the phase angle is theta1 minus theta2. Here's an example of how we can, can uh, represent this. So think of this, uh, this triangle is situated in the um, complex plane where this is the imaginary axis, this is the real axis, and this is our phaser. So you might consider it like a vector. So it's kind of like vectors in a way if you want to think of it that way. Here's the real part. Here's the imaginary part. And the sum of those two 
And we just use trigono trigonometry, so uh, s sine of 33.43 is equal to um, this divided by this. So if we want the imaginary component, we take the hypotenuse times the sine of 33.43, because we want the opposite. Here we want the adjacent, so we take the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. Okay, so we can decompose this into its, um, its imaginary and real uh, components and just add a J before the, the imaginary. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're going to discuss impedance. Um, it's, again, this is a quick tour. Uh, but basically, uh, let's start with uh, a resistor is something we're, we're very familiar with already. So we have this V, the V and the I. And in the phasor notation, we use a capital V, boldface V, and a boldface I. And so we're going to look at the current and voltage relationships for each of these. So starting with the resistor, we have V equals IR. And as you see in the sine wave, that the current and the voltage are in phase with each other. And this is because the resistor is a real number. If we move on to the inductor now, I'm going to actually introduce you to somebody I know, and his name is Eli the Iceman. This is a good way of remembering um, how the voltage and current relationships are in, in inductors and capacitors. So in this case, um, we take the V is equal to I times the impedance, which is ZL, and the impedance is J omega L. So the amount that it resists current um, is related to omega. So the higher the frequency, the more I push back on the current flow. It's also an imaginary value. So if I think of the J as the positive imaginary axis, so this would be the J, that's a 90 degree angle with respect to the positive real axis. Okay, So what happens is that the voltage is equal to the current it advanced by 90 degrees. So the voltage, or V doesn't really work here, but if you think of E as the electromotive force, in an inductor, the voltage leads the current. Okay, there we get Eli. So we have L in an inductor, the L, the voltage leads the current. So you see the voltage comes first and the current follows. We're going to move on to the capacitor now. And here's Eli, the Iceman. So in this case, um, sorry for the markings here, if we, let's start with the equation, V equals I Z C. So it's really the same equation. V equals I R, V equals I Z L, V equals I Z C. So this impedance concept is a universal concept that obeys Ohm's law. In this case, the current times the impedance. Okay, now in this case, the impedance has a magnitude of 1 over omega c. This means the impedance goes down in magnitude as omega increases. So at low frequency or zero frequency, I have an open circuit. At high frequency, I have a very small impedance. The j in the denominator, if we multiply numerator and denominator by j, I'll get j on the top and minus 1 on the bottom. So this will be um, the magnitude is um, so it'll be minus j. It'll be minus j over omega c. So that would be on the negative imaginary axis or minus 90 degrees. And of course, the ice man. This is a capacitor, and if you look at the expression here, the current leads 
the voltage. And here's a summary of what we just discussed. Um, in general, an impedance may have a real component, which would be resistive, and an imaginary component that we call the reactance. The reactance of a resistor is zero because it's a purely real resistance. Inductors have a purely imaginary. Oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, inductors are purely imaginary, so it's pure reactance, and the capacitor is also pure reactance, but it's uh, a negative. So if you see R minus J10, that means it's, a capa it's basically capacitive reactance. If it's R plus J10, that would be inductive reactance. And the last piece, and this is actually, uh, we're going a little bit ahead here on uh, 9.5 in the textbook. Uh, this is just to show you that series circuits with the Zs act just like resistors. So if I want to find the equivalent resistance of, uh, of that circuit, I can just take and add when these impedances are in series, I can simply add the series impedances. For parallel, it's the same formula as we had for resistors. Okay, So we have I times Z EQ, and if they're in parallel, uh, we use the standard resistor formula for the equivalent impedance. So that's uh, a very nice relationship. Here's a summary. Now, uh, sometimes when we're working with parallel um, parallel elements, it's easier to add the admittances. Now, the admittances is like the like the corollary to conductance for resistors. Okay, so resistor where we added the conductances if the elements were in parallel. Now, for inductors or capacitors, those we have uh, imaginary admittance values, and that imaginary part is called the susceptance. Okay. Uh, for, again, here's for a resistor, 1 over R is equal to the conductance. Uh, for the inductor, uh, YL equals 1 over ZL, and then rearranging, we get this expression. And then finally for C, uh, we get the result shown um, in the table. So I'm going to prepare um, some example problems, uh, and you'll see these um, hopefully within the next day or two. Um, and we, we can talk about those uh, if you finish present, presenting your um, problems. Um, and then we'll pick up with this next week. Uh, one of the problems is finding the RMS value of this periodic waveform, um, and it will not be uh, Vm over the square root of 2. It is not a sinusoid. It is a half-wave rectified waveform, and so if we put an AC voltmeter across a half-wave rectifier, this is what it would read. It would be the RMS value. So we'll see that, um, and I will do that offline rather than record it. And another problem is going to give us um, uh, the, the voltage input and the current input. And inside is some unknown circuit. But we want to know what is its equivalent impedance. And we can find that, again, just using Ohm's law. Quite simple. So that's it for today. And... Um, I will produce this video and post it on the website, probably in YouTube.